Good morning. It's Jeff Christian of CPM Group. It's Friday, the 24th of June, uh, about just a shy of 10 o'clock in New York when we're recording this. What I want to talk about today is really the macroeconomic environment, uh, inflation, interest rates, recession, um, and the implication that the economic environment has for gold and silver. Uh, you know, the markets have been very volatile. We had the Fed raise uh, the Fed funds rate by 75 bips. You had not just gold and silver, but all markets react very strongly, both in anticipation of that and then afterward. You saw increased volatility across markets. Oil prices are off something like $16 from where they were prior to the increase already. You're seeing a tremendous amount of anxiety and concern about the state of the world. And what we're finding is very superficial conversations about the economic environment in the broader mainstream media and also in the precious metals areas. So, and it's understandable. I mean, these are complicated issues and they don't lend themselves to simplistic headlines, uh, but the broader media and the gold and silver uh, conversations that we see are designed for short-term uh, headlines. So you have to worry about that and you have to put it into perspective. I, I guess that's a warning that this may run a little bit longer than some of our other uh, videos because we like to be thorough. We understand that people have an attention of, you know, 12 to 18 minutes at the most. Uh, we like to be brief and succinct, but these are complex issues and they, re they deserve your attention. So talk about gold and silver. As I said, you know, we've seen the other markets as well as gold and silver, very rough. Gold and silver prices have come down. Uh, people are wondering what that means because they thought that, that we were seeing high inflation. Uh, people are assuming that the higher interest rates will have a negative uh, impact on demand for gold and silver, um, which obviously they are because the prices have come off. Uh, and there is a lot of anxiety and fear, and the fear mongers are taking advantage of it. Uh, so I think you need to do that. And then we're going to talk about interest rates and put the interest rate hike in perspective, uh, interest rates and recessions, the relationship there, what causes recessions? Because it's really capacity constraints and inflation that are primarily uh, causing inflation. But you see a lot of people saying stuff like, the Fed has caused every recession ever. Uh, not exactly true. That's like saying, the, saying that the Fed's interest rate increases cause recessions is like saying that your aspirin that you're taking to fight a fever is causing the fever. The Fed reacts to the real economy, not to the stock market the way some people seem to think, but to the real economy. And they look at capacity constraints and inflation. So if you want to know where we are economically, you don't necessarily look at those interest rates. You look at capacity, uh, supply, and demand of goods and services, and inflation conditions. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to run through some aspects of the economy so that you can understand why the Fed says, hey, there's still a lot of capacity. There's still a lot of rope in this economy that, that we probably are not imminently in a recession already or imminently, but rather than, yes, there is a recession coming at some point in the next three or four or five years, uh, and no one knows when it's going to come or how big it's going to be or how deep it's going to be or how long it's going to last or what it's going, what's going to precipitate it. But, you know, let's have a realistic view. Current economic capacity conditions. Then I'll talk a little bit about gold and silver our expectations for the next few months. And then I have some housekeeping notes, which are always good to stay around and listen to. So yes, gold and silver prices came down. They came down hard in anticipation of the interest rate increase and in anticipation of a more severe anti-inflationary stance on the part of the Fed and other central banks such as the ECB and, and, and the uh, Bank of England. You're seeing that. 
These prices go through June 21st, so they're a few days out of date. Silver has now dropped below uh, $21, and it's trading in that $2021 range. Uh, gold is trading around 1826. Um, and I said, as I said, I'll try to come back to our views about this as we go. Amanda Gorman, uh, the youth poet laureate who's, who read a great poem at uh, Biden's inauguration in 2020, had an editorial in the New York Times. And she said, or she wrote, now more than ever, we have every right to be affected, afflicted, and affronted. If you're alive, you're afraid. If you're not afraid, then you're not paying attention. I would use the term anxiety because fear often carries with it an adrenaline surge and emotional waves that cloud one's ability to think rationally. It's very funny because someone to whom I said that said, well, you know, psychologists define fear and anxiety differently than when you studied psychology in the early 1970s, late 1960s. Uh, but yeah, I get it. The reality is that fear takes your thoughts back to the amygdala and you react in a defensive way. Anxiety takes your thoughts to the front, frontal lobes where you can think more rationally about what you ought to be doing. And that's really what we need to do, especially when we're looking at interest rates. Fed funds rates have started to rise. They're up to 1.5, 1.75. You can see here, how low that is. You have to go back to the Eisenhower administration to find uh, Fed funds rates that low. And even then, they were only there very briefly in the depths of recessions, the two recessions that we had during the Eisenhower. So Fed fund rates are far too low to really induce a recession at this point. They are rising, and that is problematic. It raises the costs of living, the cost of doing business, the cost of paying federal debt, which is now more than $30 trillion, but that's another story. Concept of anxiety versus fear. When the Fed increased its interest rate 75 bips, you saw all over the place, this is the biggest increase in, in, in Fed funds rates since 1994. We're going into a recession. But let's look at 1994. Let's look at here someplace. We had interest rates, Fed funds rates rise, raised 75 bips. The Fed funds rate over the course of that year, that 75 bips was just a portion of the increases in the Fed funds rates that year. They went from 2.85% at the beginning of 1994 to 4.94% at the end of 1994. They rose, interest rates rose 73% in 1994. And they didn't throw us into a recession. In fact, that was the beginning of a very long period of very strong growth of, of, of GDP that la uh, lasted seven years. It led to people who think superficially coining the phrase, the new economic paradigm. The Dow Jones was heading to $40,000 within a matter of months. Uh, the, there would be no more inflation, there'd be no more recessions, the tech stock boom went, came, went into full swing. It all ended with tears in March of 2001, right? And that recession in 2001 lasted eight months. Fed raised interest rates 75 bips in the context of a broader upward move it didn't, they, they raised them from a much higher level, 2.85 at the start of it. <laughs> we were starting at zero. We're up to 1.5. We may get up to 2.85 at some point in this uh, cycle of raising interest rates. By the way, people who are telling you that the Fed's going to have to pivot, they're not the Fed. And they probably know a lot less about interest rate markets and money markets than the Fed. Um, I saw somebody on the internet yesterday calling the bozos at the Fed. Well, those bozos know a lot more than he does. And I have a great, much greater respect for them than I do for him. But that's beside the point. 
reality is that we have a tremendous amount of rope on interest rates and interest rates don't necessarily cause inflation interest rates may contribute to the onset of a inflation uh, of a recession but it has to do with capacity constraints and inflation so again let's look at inflation here we are we saw last month in may a one percent increase in in the inflation rate uh month over month 8.6 on a uh year over year basis on headlines and the second decline from the peak in March in the core inflation, ex food and energy, right? And again, if you go back to May, we were up to 3% there, 5% on the headline. And if you go back to February of 2021, we were at 1.6%. So we are about 15, 16 months into an inflationary period. This is the increase in inflation rates, percentage changes. It's not hyperinflation, and it's nothing like the 14 years that we had between, say, 1968 and 1982, where inflation was persistently above 5% almost the entire time and got as high as 14%. So we're not into a period of high inflation, and we're probably not in, headed into a period of persistent high inflation such as what we saw in the 70s, because so many things have changed economically and financially. That's probably not in the offering. We have a weather forecaster here in New York who always says offering instead of offing, and it's become a trope in my house. These are the actual levels of consume, the consumer price index, the actual statistical levels, percent change year ago. Let's look at some of the components of the real housing, uh, of the real economy. Here are the housing prices, and you'll hear it over and over again. Average price of the houses, house sales rose 33% over a couple of years. All right. Fewer lower priced houses are being sold. They're down percent, uh, the housing sales are down 12% from recent peaks. Because what happens is as the housing price goes up, People who are buying and selling $5 million homes continue to buy and sell $5 million homes. They're not suffering. But people who are looking for $100,000, $300,000, $500,000 homes, $1 million homes, $2 million homes, they actually don't buy houses. So what you're seeing is if you just look at the average price of new home sales, you get a distorted view of a hyperinflationary housing market. We have housing market problems. We have a tremendous mismatch in the housing stock available and with the housing stock that people need. And the demographics of the country have changed, but the housing industry hasn't changed to meet its need. And there are all sorts of other problems that are behind that. So there is a housing problem, but you have to put it into perspective. The high housing prices have led to fewer lower high, uh, lower price houses being sold. Oh, it's economic 101. Let's look at real GDP. This is the actual level of in billions of dollars, inflation adjusted dollars, of economic output in the United States. You can see the big recession uh, saw a drop in real GDP, real economic output in measured in, in billions of dollars or any other unit of dollars. We saw a sharp decline when the world locked down in 2020. We saw a sharp recovery starting in early 2001 and then a slower progressive increase. And now it's kind of peaking, kind of peaking, which is different from falling into a recession. We saw one quarter of negative growth in the first quarter of this year in the United States and in some of the other major industrialized countries. The big decline in 2020, the big increase in 2021, we are basically in line with where we should be. Will we see a quarter of negative growth? 
Probably not. The data so far in the second quarter, quarter is, ends next week. The data so far suggests uh, that you'll see positive growth in the second quarter and positive growth in the third quarter too. To understand that negative growth in the first quarter, you have to say, what happened? These are inventories, total business inventories. Here you can see February, this enormous decline in business inventories. If you look at the negative aspects that caused that dip down in GDP in the first quarter, the biggest factor were business inventories were not being rebuilt they were being liquidated. And they were being liquidated for a couple reasons. One was that a lot of businesses couldn't get the things that they hold in inventory. You have supply constraints, supply chain constraints, supply delivery constraints. You have a shortage of, uh, of long haul truck drivers. You have uh, new rules in Long Beach and Los Angeles that have slowed the uh, um, unloading of ships coming in with goods from overseas, and then goods from domestic production as well as overseas have problems with the trucking shortage. You have a number of problems that caused inventories and in business to fall. In addition to that, you started seeing people moving toward a higher interest rate environment, rising interest rate environment, and uh, concerns about uh, lower growth. So you saw businesses pull back on inventories. They've started to come back up. This data only goes through, um, I think April, might be May, so that you're starting to see some increase. But the negative factor that led to that negative GDP figure in the first quarter seems to be absent this time. This is industrial production. And you can see again the big spike down in 2020, the big spike up in 2021. And right now, over the last several months, we have basically been running at a relatively high level of industrial production compared to anything really going back to about 1990. So industrial production is chugging along pretty well. And that's the utilization rates are relatively low. You'll see here. This chart is very interesting, and, and you can go and find the charts where people show you interest rates versus recessions, and they say, oh my God, high interest rates cause recessions. No, this is, chart is very similar. High capacity utilization and inflationary pressures cause high interest rates and recessions. The causality is in the real economy, because it's real. And here, you we have seen capacity utilization rise sharply 2021 into 2022 and continue to rise 20 in 2022, but is below that 80% threshold that economists say above 80% you're running into concerns about uh, uh, potential recessionary pressures be coming in because of the capacity constraints. And you can see how the capacity constraints, capacity utilization rates have peaked at progressively lower levels, really for the last 50 some odd years as the, the industry becomes more efficient. But you can also see that that 80% threshold has been very important all through it. And we're getting close to it, but we still have capacity utilization, uh, capacity to be utilized and to grow. And then these are the business tendency survey of manufacturers. So this is people asking the businesses what their intentions are with capacity utilization. And this is for the United Kingdom. And again, you can see they're much more slack, probably exacerbated by Brexit. Things on housekeeping. We had a question about M2 and silver. I'll address it in a second. Uh, we had a criticism about CPM's data. And I had said that, you know, we thought that we would have a conversation with Wall Street Silver uh, posted by now. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address that now. Uh, I did record a conversation with Wall Street Silver on Monday as planned, uh, but Wall Street Silver has uh, decided not to post it. Let's go to the M2. Somebody asked, good presentation. I 
think this was last Tuesday's uh, presentation, perhaps the recent 40% increase in M2 in, 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 in do US dollar supply uh, could be addressed as a possible impact on civil prices going forward. Well, here's M2. And I know a lot of people in the silver and gold uh, promotion business have been talking about M2 instead of M1 or MZM, uh, which is probably the right way to look at it. We like to look at M1, M2, and MZM. We put a lot more emphasis on MZM than many other people do uh, because the correlations don't work out so well, uh, but we do think that the broader, broadest money supply, MZM replaced M3 uh, because M3 just wasn't capturing all of the money that's out there. Uh, we think that the broadest measure of money supply, MZM, is probably the better measure to look at on a long-term basis. But here you can see that M2 peaked late 2021, uh, the growth rate, the percentage change in money supply for uh, M2 peaked around 28%. And it's come back down and as of May, we were getting to the point where it was almost back to the levels that, well, uh, it was back to the levels that we saw in the inter-recessionary period between say 2009 and 2020. Uh, it's not as low as it was for most of that period of time, uh, but it is into getting into that zone. So we don't necessarily see inflationary pressures for money supply. Yeah, there were those problems out there, they are contributing to the inflationary pressures, but most of the inflationary pressures are coming from fiscal stimulus from the White House and Congress, which has been going on for 40, 50 years uh, or longer, and from the supply constraints on the supply side of the real, real economy, coupled with demand pressure as people are buying more and they're buying things that they had foregone in 2020. As one person in the travel and leisure section said, we're going to have three vacation seasons this summer, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And that's causing a lot of inflationary pressures on hotels and airlines and car rentals and, and restaurant food and everything else. But we don't see M2 or any of the other monetary aggregates as the major factor that could push inflation higher and lead to higher silver prices. We see money supply actually reacting to the real economy. We pay attention to the real economy because that's where inflation mostly comes from. Right now it's coming from the supply side and from fiscal uh, imbalances, and that's worrisome, but we're not so much worried about M2. Now, we published our silver facts and fantasies piece. Uh, we had a webinar three weeks ago, and uh, we posted it on YouTube. And somebody said, well, I don't understand how CPM Group could show 130 million ounces of silver coin demand in 2021 and only 100 million ounces. Well, if you bought and read and understood our silver year books, you would know that for probably 20 years now, there's been net dis dis hoarding of thousand ounce and other silver bars and a pivoting by investors of physical silver to silver coins and to silver ETFs. So you have seen silver coins go from a very small portion of silver inventories held by investors to about 1.4 billion ounces now. And that has reflected the shift away from bullion. So for decades, people who are in the silver market have known that you're seeing this shift away from bars to coins, which by the way, is one of the reasons why inventories uh, of thousand ounce bars in some markets actually are somewhat lower than they used to be. So it's, really, it's, it's nothing surprising that you're seeing coin demand greater than total physical demand. That's been the case for several years shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And then he mentioned, well, World Silver Survey has 279. Well, and we made the accurate assessment that perhaps one of the reasons why this fellow has been wrong on silver price direction 
for his entire career because he's using bad data. There's a lot of bad data out there. And actually, if you go to this website here, CPM Group, we have in our market views, a, a section called the importance of accurate data. And in that section, there are articles from 2003, and I think 2015, about some of the problems with bad data. Because bad data has been common in the gold and silver markets for 6,000 years. Yeah, the nature of gold and silver markets. And there are people who have bad data. And if you use bad data, you're going to have bad results in your analysis. CPM Group's existence, we started as Jay Aaron's research department in the 1960s when the gold market and silver markets were opening up to private investment demand. And Jay Aaron created a research department predicated on the view that the gold and silver markets were full of no information and bad information. This is Catskill food. Not only is there, you know, is there very little information out there, but it's bad. Jay Aaron said, if we can have a better stream of data and information on gold and silver markets and better analysis, we can regularly beat the market. And they created the Jay Aaron Research Department, which became the, the Goldman Sachs Commodities Research Group, uh, which began, became CPM Group in 1986 when we spun out of J. Aaron Goldman Sachs. And our existence and our exceptional track record in calling gold, silver, and platinum group metals prices is based on our better data and our better analysis. That's simple. So you can go to our website and you can find order. And these things that are, that are there, they were published in what was then probably the best commodities magazine in existence in 2003 and a presentation from 2015. These things have been in the public domain for decades. There's no reason not to know them, especially if you want to invest in precious metals. So I encourage everyone to go to our website and look at them, They've an article, from 2003, and then there is a presentation from 2015, and then there's an excerpt of that presentation that just focuses in on some of the issues with silver data, where there have been miscountings of billions of ounces of silver over the last 20, 25 years since other people came into the business and said, oh, we can be silver analysts too. That's all I have for today. I'll talk to you next week. Have a good weekend. Be good to yourself. Be good to all those people around you. Um, and uh, feel free to come to CPM Group's website. Not only do we have that information that I was just talking about, there's all kinds of free reads there, uh, including information on silver conspiracy theories and silver market manipulation, including the two, two of the three uh, reports that the CFTC have issued uh, on detailed investigations that they've made into allegations of silver market conspiracies and suppression programs. It'd be very interesting for you to read if you believe that stuff. Thank you, take care, talk to you next week.